So thank you again, Sunshine, and thank you for having us here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session on co-creating a framework for embedding key traits of inclusive SciComm in SciComm practice. During this session, we'll share the work that our team has been doing to operationalize the key traits of inclusive SciComm and create a tool that can be used by SciCommers to have a more intentional, equitable, and inclusive practice. Before we begin, we'd love for you all to introduce yourself in the chat and feel free to share where you're joining us from, how you engage in SciCom, and one thing you're hoping to learn from this session. As you do that, we will introduce ourselves. I am Carlisa Callwood and I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently the Director of Community Conservation, Education and Action at the Perry Institute for Marine Science. And I'm also a board member for the SciComm Trainers Network. And I'll ask my other presenters to introduce themselves as well. Thanks, Carly, so for kicking us off. My name is Rose Hendricks. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the American Society for Cell Biology with scientific societies and also support a network called Listen Network, Leaders in Science and Technology Engagement Networks. It's a little meta. Marissa? Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Marissa Weiss, um, and I work in climate science engagement and outreach uh, with the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center based at UMass Amherst. And um, I am also a board member of the SciComm Trainers Network. And I'll hand it over to Temis. Hi, my name is Temis Taylor. My pronouns are she, her. I am with Utah State University and Exact Communication. I'm zooming in from Logan, Utah on Shoshone lands about 40 miles south of the Bear River Massacre site. I came to science communication work by way of my research on public perceptions of environmental and climate risks. And with that, I think we can get started. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. So before we get started, here's a snapshot of what we'll cover today. First, we'll share about what inspired this work and then take a look at the role of white supremacy culture in the SciComm field. This will include two breakout sessions. Then after a short break, we'll talk about what is necessary for creating change in this field and then do a third breakout, which will focus on working together to co-create a framework. Lastly, we'll touch on next steps and how you can follow up or further contribute to this work. So our work here was inspired by the key traits of inclusive SciComm that emerged from the landscape study on the state of inclusive SciComm con conducted by the Metcalf Institute in 2019 and 2020, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And they identified three key traits that fundamentally characterize inclusive SciComm and set it apart from SciComm in general. These are intentionality, intentional consideration of the audiences we work with, how science is defined, and how marginalized identities are and have been represented and supported, reciprocity, addressing past and present inequities through equal partnerships that prioritize co-creation and varied forms of expertise, and reflexivity, continuous, systematic, and critical reflection on ourselves and our practice, coupled with the necessary adaptations to address what is uncovered. This served as our jumping off point to consider, if these are the key traits of inclusive SciComm, how do we as science communicators and SciComm trainers know if we're hitting on these key aspects in our practice? And is there a tool that can help us assess this and motivate action that facilitates more diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work? So we set out to develop a framework to help us operationalize these key traits based on our spheres of influence and the interactions between these two dimensions. And we'll get more into the specific details of this a bit later. But we recognize that in order for this tool, um, for this to be a tool that can be used broadly, we needed to work collectively with others in the field. Thus, the major focus of this workshop today is to co-create this framework, one that is actionable, accessible, and scalable, and also facilitates reflection, assessment, and accountability. So this will be a working session where we invite you to reflect and share, 
but also to critique and evaluate. We welcome collaboration and feedback as we work towards co-creating something that is actionable, ongoing, iterative, and also open source. And now I'll turn it over to Temis, who will give us a primer on why we're talking about what white supremacy culture. Lisa, we began our process by examining white supremacy culture as the context in which science and science communication takes place. Our approach to white supremacy culture follows the work of Oaken and Jones, who identified 15 characteristics of white supremacy culture, things like perfectionism, individualism, and defensiveness. These characteristics are often valued as essential for success in scientific fields and science communication. The, the 15 characteristics are all interconnected and mutually reinforcing. They have strong links to cultural myths and biases. Can we go to the next slide? White supremacy culture is embedded in scientific institutions it's pervasive and so it can be difficult to see a name and this makes it particularly challenging to address. So to think about the way white supremacy culture operates, let's look more closely at two characteristics that are particularly relevant in science, objectivity and perfectionism. The desire for science and scientists to be objective creates impatience with any thinking that does not appear to be logical. Emphasis on objectivity can cause us to deny emotion, something that makes science and scientists inaccessible to audiences. Perfectionism is another characteristic of white supremacy culture. When we're striving for perfectionism, making a mistake is confused with being a mistake. This can lead to, lead to reluctance to engage in science communication. Striving for perfectionism can encourage those who have already received validation to seek out training and opportunities for science communication, while at the same time discouraging others. This in turn can lead to things like the myth of meritocracy and imposter syndrome. Biased standards of practice in STEM are inherited. Their effects are compounded by the traditions of hiring, promotion, funding, and recognition in science. They benefit few and harm many. White supremacy culture harms everyone, but those who are Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other minoritized identities are harmed the most. Some of the most pernicious myths and beliefs science communicators contribute to include the single story narrative, the myths of meritocracy and solitary genius, and the power of normal. Science communicators also disproportionately amplify science by white researchers, which furthers associations between whiteness and authority, accomplishment, and skill. And so together, these false ideas tilt science toward white supremacy characteristics while limiting recognition to those who are already centered. We'll be using our work today to explore how science communication, science communication training can be agents of change and mitigate white supremacy culture in STEM. Marissa? Thanks, so we've arrived at our first breakout and our first um, interactive session where we'll be exploring um, the questions that Tem has set up in, in a bit more detail. And so in preparation for going into our breakouts, um, I just wanted to briefly set intentions and um, amplify the um, code of conduct that, that Sunshine mentioned that we've all agreed to um, in preparation for being here. So in our breakout rooms, we'll be welcoming. We will invite and include all people to participate. We will be present. We will listen respectively and actively, and we will value diverse perspectives. We'll be accountable for our interactions. We'll communicate openly and thoughtfully and we'll be considerate of opinions, um, even if they're different from our own opinions and views, even if um, we don't share those opinions ourselves. We will respect confidentiality. So lessons learned can leave the room, but stories stay within the breakout room. 
the in the breakout in this first breakout room we'll address the question we'll take on the question what is the role of psycom in perpetuating white supremacy culture and so to take on that big question we'll focus it um on how can the absence of a key trait of inclusive psycom contribute to white supremacy culture in psycom so each room will take on one trait and together we'll address all of the traits collectively. When you get into your room, um, you'll get there by following a link to a Google document. You'll get there by following the Zoom prompt. Uh, but paired with that, um, there'll be a link in the chat to access a Google Doc. Um, navigate within the Google Doc um, to the page that corresponds with your breakout room number. And there you'll find which trait you're focusing on. So you'll see a question like, how might the absence of uh, intentionality contribute to white supremacy issues in the field of psychom. When you get in your room, please introduce yourself um, to the others in your room. You'll be in the same, we'll reopen these same rooms for the subsequent breakouts. Um, so um, when you set up, um, when once you've done interruption, excuse me, once you've done introductions, uh, please establish roles and then we'll rotate the roles for the subsequent breakouts. The roles are moderator, recorder, and reporter. Um, and so to do this quickly in the first one, you might, um, the moderator might be the person with whose name alphabetically comes closest to the start of the alphabet. And perhaps the recorder could be the person whose name alphabetically comes closer to the end. Um, and a reporter could be a volunteer who's comfortable with that. Um, and then you can document your responses within the Google document. And we will conclude um, this breakout at, I think we'll conclude at 1.36. So you'll, we'll have six minutes for this conversation. Marissa, let's note also that um, Sunshine has put here, if you need captions or ASL interpretations, stay in the main room and we'll have a conversation here. Thank you. The prior themes feed into the final one of inclusivity, which can be achieved by creating a climate for diversity and will lead to an increased sense of belonging and visibility. This must also include actively challenging and dismantling the oppressive systems in place, particularly when you can speak from a position of power, privilege, or status. And also always holding ourselves and others accountable for actively and continually progressing in this work. So we are proposing this inclusive SciComm framework as one possible solution to incorporating these actions in our work. As mentioned during our intro, we created a matrix that crosses the key traits of inclusive SciComm with six levels of influence. These spheres of influence depict the areas that we individually can directly control or have some sort of influence on. And by using this model, we can envision actions to take or articulate questions to ask that can realistically be taken into consideration to create forward momentum within each sphere. So we'll run through what each of these spheres of influences look like. At the individual level, you can make direct changes for yourself based on evaluating how your own values beliefs, and motivations affect your behavior. At this level, you should be considering, what should psychomers do to have a personal impact on the field? Moving onwards to interpersonal, this is influencing those you interact with. These are the interactions you have with others, including family and coworkers. Consider, how can we work within our personal networks to create change in the field? Next is the community sphere how you influence your wider community. Consider how can we work with our local communities to make the interactions more accessible, inclusive, and equitable. Expanding further, we can think about how we influence the institutions we work for or with. Consider what changes can we make or encourage in our organizations to make an impact? And while the amount of influence you might have varies based on your position in the organization, it's important to remember that we all have the ability to lead from where we are to create change. 
The last two spheres are societal. First, how we influence society based on current or potential policies. So consider what policies we can advocate for or champion. And lastly, how we influence society based on broader culture. Consider how can we work collectively to shift our culture into one that is more equitable, inclusive, and accessible. Now keep in mind that as you move outwards from the first sphere, your level of direct influence becomes smaller and enacting change in these areas might be more difficult as it would require commitment and momentum on successively broader scales. However, we ask you to consider your aspirational influence. What actions would you like to see at these levels and how can you play a role in making that happen? So now we'll ask you to think about how do the three key traits of inclusive SciComm intersect with the six spheres of influence to guide authentic change? Our team has worked on creating an initial matrix, but now we would like to work with you to further de develop how we can flesh this tool out. And I'll turn it over to Marissa, who will talk us through our third breakout. Thank you, Carlisa. So um, we've reached our, our third breakout, co-developing the framework. Um, and so um, why are we doing this? Um, we're doing this to break the cycle of SCICOM, the, any roles that SCICOM has in perpetuating white supremacy culture in STEM. And our, our mission is to start using SCICOM to address white supremacy culture in STEM. Um, and so how will we do it? Um, today, our work involves iterating on a draft framework with, with a goal of creating a useful tool. Um, and also, um, as, you're, as you're engaging with in the breakout, um, if this activity makes you think, maybe this isn't the tool, but it makes you think um, have ideas about what could be better, then that's a success too. This is intended as a, a starting point. We have to start somewhere, but it's um, really intended as a launching off point to generate ideas. So how will this work be used? Um, we're collecting responses in Google Documents and we'll compile this information into a report. Um, we being the workshop uh, leaders will compile this information into a, a report intended for um, the group of about um, 53 of us in, in this meeting today. All of us are um, our co-creators in, in this work that we're doing. Um, and, and the immediate next step after the report will be an invitation to join a working group. So everyone participating as, as co-creators, we'd like to know if you'd like to um, continue working on this and uh, design it into a testable, um, a testable tool. So what we're about to do in, in breakout rooms is focus on this framework that Carlisa introduced. Um, so we have the three traits of inclusive SciComm at the, on the top, we have intentionality, reciprocity, and reflexivity. And then on the side, we have the spheres of influence um, from individual to um, societal, societal culture. And so in, in a room, um, will be each room will have an assignment that's either that's to focus in on either a row or a column um, so um, if we're you're focusing in on a row it would be just thinking about the individual sphere across the three traits or if you're focusing on a column um, then you might be looking sticking within intentionality but looking across all of the spheres um, and so within that focus area, then um, we'll focus even more, um, even more specifically cell by cell. And um, the goal is to brainstorm questions or actions or ideas or thoughts that come up as you think about um, what would a science communication professional um, need to know or need to do or need to think about when thinking about intentionality at the level, in this case of the individual level. So an example for this box could be, what is the role of the individual in doing intentional SCICOM? Um, 
so this is basically, it's a brainstorming exercise, document um, what comes to mind, what questions you have, um, what comes out in the conversation. A second example, um, if we're considering reciprocity and institutions at the level of institutions, um, a question that could go in that box is, what can it look like for institutions that use SciComm to engage in reciprocity? So those are some examples of, of um, what kinds of content you might put in the breakout. Um, we'll be going back into our same groups. There'll be a new Google document. So just like before, um, we'll navigate to, to the page with, with the breakout number and document, um, document in there. So, and please rotate your roles. So a new moderator, a new note taker, and a new reporter. Um, we will have until um, 3.05, so we'll have a, a longer time in this, in this breakout till 3.05 p.m.